Good morning, everyone. I am really excited to be kicking off this new series about mission this morning. And as we begin today, I'd like to ask you a question. Why are you here today? Turn to the person next to you and with a smile on your face, say, why are you here today? It's an interesting question, isn't it? Why are we here? Now, we can ask this question of ourselves, and there'll probably be a a huge range of different answers. Perhaps you're here for the first time this morning. Maybe you are here to celebrate one of our dedications today. Or perhaps you're exploring what faith in Jesus is all about. It's good, isn't it? Um, And if, um, if that's the case, it's so, so good to have you with us this morning. Why are we here? It's a question that we can not only ask ourselves as individuals, but we can ask ourselves as a church family together. Why is Barnabas Community Church here? What are we here to do? When you look at the life of our church, you see many different people doing many different things. We've heard about some of these from Dave just a minute ago. There's our gathering here this morning. Tomorrow morning, as a church, we're going to be scattered across Shrewsbury and the different villages doing our Monday morning thing. There's our community initiatives, our kids and our youth work, our midweek groups. We do a lot of different things. But what is the driving force behind all these different expressions of our church? Well, as Dave shared last week, we want the answer to that question to be mission first. Mission first. We want the mission to take the good news about Jesus to drive everything we do. It's why we're here. As we move forward together, we want mission first to be in our DNA. That if you look closely at what we do as a church, you'll see that we are driven by a mission. We're called to be a people on the move. We don't just sit around in a holy huddle in the safety of our building but we're called to go and make disciples. If you have a Bible, I'd like to invite you to open it with me to Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 to 20. The verses will also be up on the screen behind me. These are some of the most famous words in Scripture. But I want to encourage you this morning to not let the familiarity distract us from the message. Matthew 28, verses 18 to 20 says, Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. This is our mission, to go and make disciples of all nations. We want to be a church that puts this mission first to be an outward-facing, missionally-minded community of disciple-makers. I want to say that again. We want to be an outward-facing, missionally-minded community of disciple-makers. You see, the Great Commission to go and make disciples, that's not just an optional extra for a few extroverts who like talking to people and are really confident, but no, it's a command for each follower of Jesus to obey. We are called to be a people on a mission. Each of us has a role to play. Every disciple of Jesus is called to be a disciple maker. For some of us here today, that might not be as, come as a surprise to you. You may, you may know that you have a role to play in witnessing to your friends or those around you. But as we begin this series on mission, I want us to do a little bit of self-reflection. Are we practically living this out in our daily lives? Are we looking for opportunities to talk about Jesus. And I want to be honest with you this morning, I've had to take a long, hard look at myself. This is something I don't find very easy, and I've found that I've often been, been missing those opportunities to speak about Jesus with those around me. And as, as I've considered why, I felt convicted that some, in some sense, I've lost sight of the beauty and the preciousness of Jesus and what he'd done for me personally. Maybe some of you resonate with this. Do we know the love of Jesus in our lives that stirs us in a way to to, to make us active in our witnessing? You see, we speak about what we love. Are there any grandparents in the room? Hands up if you're a grandparent. 
This is not an age thing, don't worry. Um, yeah, we've got a few grandparents. Well, grandparents, they love talking about their grandkids, don't they? With great joy, they will tell you stories of what they've been doing. They've probably got their picture saved as their screensaver on their phone. And if they say, oh, would you like to see a picture of them? They don't just mean one picture, do they? They mean an entire album. And to be honest, I think sometimes they don't, they're going to show you regardless of if you're interested or not. They just, they can't help but tell you about them. Why? Because they love them. We speak about what we love. I feel stirred this morning that whether we've heard the gospel a hundred times already or never before, we need to come back to it with fresh eyes this morning. This series is all about mission. So this might seem like a bit of a strange place to start, how we as followers, we're we're talking this this next few weeks about how as followers of Jesus, we're called to go and make disciples. But in the next few weeks, we're going to be really practical about this. But I feel convicted today that we need to first come back to what Jesus has done for us in the gospel. For it's out of love for him, in worship of what he's done for us, that we are, we're called and we're stirred to go out on mission together. We need to see the mission ahead of us in light of the gospel's transforming power in our lives. This brings us to the title of today's talk, The Power of the Gospel. The gospel is the good news about the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. And it has the power to transform our lives and the lives of our friends and our families. We live in a broken world. You can see it all around us. Poverty, sickness, war, climate change, corruption. But as we open up our Bibles, we should see that this shouldn't surprise us. At the beginning of the Bible, we read how God created a beautiful world. Everything was good and he created humans, the pinnacle of it all. He was in a relationship with them, this beautiful relationship. And he'd given them the ability to to love and to choose. Through this free will, Adam and Eve, the first humans, decided to turn away from God's desires and put their trust in themselves. In this moment of disobedience, sin came into the world. No longer a perfect creation, but broken and marred by human disobedience to God. This separated humanity from God because he is perfect and he is just. His perfect justice meant that he wouldn't leave sin unpunished. But his perfect love meant that he would not leave humanity without hope. The Bible tells us this amazing story of how God had made a way for humanity to come back into a relationship with himself. Despite continuing to fail and to turn from God, he made a way for them to be saved and to be forgiven. And he did this in the most amazing way possible. He came himself. Jesus Christ, who is the Son of God, stepped down from heaven. He was with with his Father in heaven in a place that is literally beyond our imagination. And yet, he willingly came to earth in the weakness of human form as a baby. He grew up to become an amazing teacher. He was kind and compassionate. He was bold and authentic. He was gentle and lowly. He performed many miracles and he taught his followers how to live a life that was pleasing to God. But all of this, all of it, was leading to the the ultimate reason why he needed to come. To lay down his life for the sake of others. He was arrested. He was brutally tortured And then he was hung on a Roman cross. This was a shameful and an agonizing way to die. As he pushed up on the nails which held his hands and feet in place, he cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It was in this moment of pain and desperation that the full weight of humanity's sin was laid upon Jesus. The ultimate suffering was separation from Father God. After his death, Jesus was buried in a tomb, but three days later, he rose from the dead. His still, lifeless body got up and walked out of the tomb. We read in a book called 1 Corinthians 15 that he appeared to over 500 people 
And then he ascended to heaven. He went back to be with his father and to sit at his right hand. But, but why? Why did Jesus come and why did he die? Romans chapter 6 verse 23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The punishment, the just punishment for sin is death and an eternal separation from God. It was what we as sinners have earned. It's our wages. But Paul writes elsewhere in Romans, God demonstrates his own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. We could never earn forgiveness. We could never make ourselves right with God. But on the cross, Jesus took the penalty that you and I deserved, meaning that we could be forgiven. And in his resurrection, as he rose from the dead, he defeated death itself, making a way for us to have an eternal relationship with him. Maybe this is the first time you've heard what Jesus has done for you. And if you want to be in a relationship with God where you are forgiven of your sins and have a hope of a future with him, then the response is actually really simple. Believe in him and turn from the wrong things in your life. If you want to make that step of commitment today to to trust in Jesus, I want to encourage you to come and maybe speak to me or one of our prayer ministry team at the end. They'll be at the front. We'd absolutely love to be able to speak to you and to pray with you. For many people here today, you know Jesus. You know his transforming work in your own life. And so what's our response to the gospel? I believe we need to come back to that place of joy as we see the gospel again this morning. Jesus' death on the cross is for everyone. God loved the world that he sent his son. But I think sometimes in remembering and focusing on the world, it can be easy to miss the beautiful reality that Jesus came for me. I felt like this is almost as if I'd been seeing the the cleansing of Jesus as his blood's poured out on the cross, as if it's like having a shower. It's, It's general, and in some ways it's kind of mechanical, isn't it? And I think it misses the relationship and the care in which Jesus came. As I was thinking about this, I had a picture, and this picture was Jesus, he came to me, and he gently and he compassionately wiped my face of all the, the, the dirt and the stains like a, like a mother who's cleaning up their child after a mealtime. I felt struck that this is what our relationship with Jesus is like. God sent Jesus to save me, to save you. Jesus died on the cross for you. He suffered and bled for you, not because you deserved it, but because of his great love for you. Do you know the joy of a relationship with Jesus? It's out of love for Jesus that we're stirred to tell others about what he's done. When you know his joy and his peace in your life, you you just can't help but tell others too. Alongside our personal testimony of what God has done in our lives, we also get to see the gospel's transforming power in the lives of those around us. How awesome is it to see God at work in the lives of our friends and our family here at Barnabas? However long ago it was that you met Jesus, through community together we get to see and hear how God is working today. It's such a joy to hear testimonies of how God is moving, saving and transforming people's lives. Paul says in Romans 1, the gospel is the power of God which brings salvation to everyone who believes. The gospel has power, power to save us from eternal death to eternal life. It changes our eternal destiny. But not only that, it changes our life now. John Ortberg writes, the good news is not just the minimal entrance requirements for getting into heaven when you die. It is about the glorious redemption of human life, your life. For me, on the surface, I don't have a particularly dramatic story of life transformation. And to be honest with you, I really struggled with this for quite a long time. I thought my testimony was boring. I've never um, done drugs. I've never stolen. I've never, really, I've never done anything dramatic. I was brought up in a, a Christian home. And from an early age, I've never really doubted the existence of God. But despite, on the surface, maybe that's a little uninspiring. In all reality... 
The fact that Jesus would save me is a miracle. I am totally undeserving of his love. In fact, what I've earned is the punishment for my sin, which is death and separation from him. And yet, Jesus came to save me. That is crazy. God, the maker of the universe, stepped down from heaven to take the punishment which I deserved. Accepting Jesus into my life has not only changed my eternal future, it's hugely impacted my life now. I'm not for one second going to suggest like my life's been hard. Many of you will have suffered far greater things than me. But when things have been tough, it's then that I've known the tender care of Jesus closest to me. A few years ago, my wife Ellie and I were on holiday. Elle's mum was uh, working abroad as a teacher at the time, and so we went out to visit her. And this was the first time I'd actually been abroad, and so I was a little bit nervous about it. Um, But a few days into our holiday, we were in a car accident. Ellie and her mum were both injured in the crash, and Elle had a, a small bleed on her brain, and so she was rushed in for scans. To skip to the end of this story, Ellie and her mum both made full recoveries, but it was in those hours of waiting not knowing whether things were going to be okay in a strange place, that, I, that, that my relationship with Jesus became ever more real to me. Don't get me wrong, I was scared. I was in this unfamiliar place. I didn't know if it was going to be okay. But knowing Jesus gave me an indescribable peace. The world is full of suffering. And so I want those that I love to know that they don't have to walk through this suffering alone. They too can have Jesus, the suffering saviour, holding them up in time of great trouble. The gospel changes us in an instant. It gives us the security of a future in heaven. But not only that, it changes us in this life. But you know, it doesn't change us so that we can sit around enjoying Bible study and meeting together, although these things are great. It changes us to be Jesus' hands and feet to take the gospel to those around us. The gospel is for everyone. So what's our response to this? We're going to spend the rest of our time this morning in three verses from Romans chapter 1. Paul's writing to the church in Rome from Corinth and he's, he's never been to this church in Rome before. And he's telling them how desperate he is to come and see them. And then in verses 14 to 16 he explains why. He says... I am obligated both to Greeks and non-Greeks, both to the wise and the foolish. That's why I'm so eager to preach the gospel also to you who are in Rome, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew, then to the Gentiles. There are three words which we're going to very briefly look at this morning as we reflect on what Paul's saying here. The first is that Paul is obligated. He's obligated both to the Greeks and the non-Greeks. The Greeks, in this sense, weren't necessarily those who were born in Greece, but they were those who were cultured, those who were learned. And then there were the non-Greeks. The literal translation of the Greek here would have been barbarians, people who were unlearned, uncultured. And as Paul sort of differentiates between these two groups. He is effectively drawing all people together. He's saying he's obligated to everyone. But an obligation, Paul's saying he owes both the Greeks and the non-Greeks. Let's unpack this a little bit. Is Paul saying here that he knows it's the right thing to do, and so in that sense he should tell people about Jesus? Or that somehow he now owes God? No, quite the opposite. The gospel is given by grace. And grace, by definition, is mercy which is undeserved. Paul saw this. He knew that he had received the gospel through nothing that he'd done himself, but as a free gift. His obligation was to give the gospel of grace to everyone, no matter what their social standing, because there was nothing that could qualify them, just as there was nothing that qualified him. It didn't matter who they were. Paul was not going to keep the gospel from people because he owed it to them as if he were in debt to them. Is that how we see people we meet? The gospel is so precious, so life transforming, and yet completely free. It's a little bit like if an elderly mother sadly passes away. 
When the time comes for her will to be read, her children gather round. As it's read out, it says, I hereby leave my diamond engagement ring to my daughter, Heather. Please treasure it as I have and pass it on with its story to your children as I have to you. This ring had been passed from generation to generation. It was a priceless family heirloom with an incredible history. Heather, who'd received the ring from her late mother, had a daughter of her own. And she, like her mother before her, owed it to her daughter to give her the ring when she was old enough to receive it. In this scenario, Heather was indebted to her daughter. She had a responsibility to give her daughter what was rightfully hers because of its incredible value. This is how Paul saw himself. He'd been given the gospel as a free gift. And he'd been entrusted with passing it to the Gentiles. Many years before, Paul had encountered Jesus on the road to to Damascus. He'd been given this special calling to take the gospel to the Gentile world. Paul's calling was unique even among the apostles. He'd been chosen to take the gospel, the good news about Jesus, beyond racial boundaries to everyone. This fueled what he did. And he felt burdened that... He needed to take the gospel to everyone, no matter what the cost. Now, although in some senses Paul's calling was unique, we too have been entrusted with the gospel, and we are called, we in fact, we are indebted to the people around us who don't know Jesus. Not because it's the right thing to do as a Christian, but because we have received a free gift so precious that we can't help but tell others about it. Paul goes on in verse 15. That's why I'm so eager to preach the gospel also to you who are in Rome. Paul was eager to preach the gospel. He was urgent in his desire to make Jesus known in Rome to all sections of society. What's interesting about this verse 15 is who is Paul talking to? Alongside his desire to preach the gospel to all the people of Rome, he appears here to be talking to the church itself. Believers, he says, to you who are in Rome. But why is Paul eager to preach the gospel to believers? Well, for the very reason that we began by returning to the gospel this morning. The gospel is not only for the salvation of unbelievers, but to inspire believers in mission. As we continually come back to Jesus, as we delight in his grace again and again, we are moved to see the need around us. Paul saw the great need for people to come to know Jesus, and he recognized the call that the church, you and I as Christians, have in this mission. He was eager to remind the church in Rome that what Jesus had done for them, so that they might go out and spread the good news along with him. We also see this actually in the life of Jesus. In Matthew 9 verses 35 to 38, it says, Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Jesus was moved by compassion for people as he saw their desperate situation. What he says to his disciples is interesting. He says, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Therefore, ask God to send out workers into his his harvest field. The world is full of great need. Millions of people don't know Jesus and so are destined to to suffer in hell away from him. And so there is an urgent need for followers of Jesus to take the good news to those around us. This is the mission that we are called to be a part of, to be moved with compassion for our friends, our neighbors, and our family, to see their greatest need and to be eager, to be urgent to tell them what Jesus has done. I believe God wants to give us a heart of compassion for those around us. This is not, tr- this is not about trying to muster up this feeling, but let's invite the Holy Spirit to work to give us a heart like Jesus's for those around us. It's in his presence the desires of our heart are transformed. Let's move to our third word. Paul is unashamed. 
He says in verse 16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it, because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. What does Paul mean when he says he's unashamed? Does he mean that in his mission to spread the good news about Jesus, he'd had nothing come against him? No one to make him feel ashamed? Well, no. Paul's life had been literally the opposite. He'd been beaten, imprisoned. He'd faced the 39 lashes from the Jews as a punishment five separate times. Those people that Paul had told about Jesus had often made him feel shame. And yet, Paul says here, he is unashamed of the gospel. Why? Because Paul had a radical perspective. He knew that whether in trial or in blessing, whether things were good or whether things were bad, he had the hope of life with Jesus. And he was willing to join him in his suffering. As the writer of Hebrews says, for the joy set before him, Jesus endured the cross. He sat down at the right hand of the throne of God and considered him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Jesus had suffered and he'd been shamed on the cross. But he disregarded that shame because of the joy that was before him. He could see that there was joy to come. Paul was unashamed of the gospel because he knew that whatever people's reaction to it was, whether it was good, good or whether it was bad, it was the power of God to bring salvation to the lost. And he had the joy of eternal life with Jesus ahead of him. So how do you feel about sharing the gospel? We need to be real. Sharing the gospel with those around us may cost us. We live in a culture where the claim that something is ultimately true can be met with questioning, often disdain. Cancel culture has become the water which we swim in. Simply sharing the gospel can, can mean that we are sidelined, can mean that our views are no longer valid. Rico Tice describes how even within our relationships with our non-Christian friends and family, there's a pain line which we have to cross when sharing the gospel. He says we don't always know if we're going to be met with hunger or with hostility. And yet, despite all of this, we have reason to be unashamed. It's a peculiar thing, but the gospel, the very thing that may bring us shame and hardship, is also the gospel that has the power in our life to break all shame and all fear. We can fix our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and the perfecter of our faith, knowing that he was put to death in our place. He faced the most shameful death on the cross, and yet he disregarded that shame because he could see what was ahead of him. The joy of returning to sit at his father's right hand and the joy of relationship with everyone who put their trust in him. As we come to an end this morning, I want us to reflect on this simple truth of the gospel. I want to firstly reiterate my invitation to anyone who isn't sure that when they die, they're going to go to heaven. If you want to respond to that call today to put your trust in Jesus, then please do come and have a chat with me or one of our prayer team or maybe speak with someone that you came with. For those of us here today who know Jesus... I believe we too are called to look with fresh eyes upon Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. It's as we fall more in love with him that we are stirred to go and tell our friends, our colleagues, and our neighbors about Jesus. We've seen today how Paul was eager. He was, he was unashamed and he was obligated in his mission to share the gospel. But I believe all of this was out of his relationship with Jesus and his hope of eternal life that he was able to say these things. This is not about gritting our teeth, telling ourselves or each other for that matter that we need to go and tell others about Jesus. But it's out of a response 
to the transforming power of the gospel in our lives. Each of us has a story to tell. You may feel like I did that your story is not particularly interesting, not particularly dramatic, but I want to encourage you today to to spend some time this week reflecting on what Jesus has done in your life. What does following Jesus mean to you? I believe it's as we come back to this, as we come back to realization of what he's done, the, the miracle of grace in our lives, that we are stirred to tell others. Like those grandparents who love their grandkids, they just can't help but tell them because of the great love they have for them. Let's invite the Holy Spirit to speak to us. This week, let's ask him to bring people to mind who don't know Jesus and to give us a heart of compassion for them. We are called to be a people on a mission. Now that's going to look different for each of us. But every single one of us has a part to play. By his grace, God does not leave us alone to do it. Next week, we're going to spend some time looking at how God has given us his spirit to empower us on his mission. We're also going to be really practical about this, and I'm really excited to be introducing next week uh, an initiative which we as a church are going to start to help us to, to keep this in the forefront of our minds. But as we, as we end this morning, I feel like we should come back to a place of worship. So I'd like to invite the band to come back up. Um, we're going to spend some time this morning reflecting and just celebrating what God has done for us. Matt started by saying that we had so many things to be thankful for. And the most, the, the most important thing that we have to be thankful for is the gospel, what Jesus has done for us. So just as we end now, I'd love to pray for us. Uh, and then let's worship together. Why don't you close your eyes? Father God, I thank you that you sent Jesus to come and to die in our place. Lord, I thank you that there is hope in you. That when, whatever life looks like, we can come to you as a God who cares because you have paid the ultimate price for us. Lord, will you help us to walk in step with your ways? Will you help us to hear your voice clearly? And will you stir us to see the need around us? Lord, we're so grateful for the work you've done in our lives. And Father, we pray. Will you help us to see those around us with eyes of compassion and with eyes of love and with grace, Lord? We thank you that your gospel is for everyone. And we thank you that you're, call, you're calling each of us to this mission, but that you've given us your spirit to equip us, Lord. Will you help us to rely on you? And we help, will you help us to delight in your grace more and more each day, Lord? Amen.